want to invite you to receive this reading of Psalm 4, as translated by Stephen Mitchell, as a prayer to hold in your hearts this Lent season. Even in the midst of great pain, Lord, I praise you for that which is. I will not refuse this grief or close myself to this anguish. Let shallow men pray for ease, comfort us, shield us from sorrow. I pray for whatever you send me, and I ask to receive it as your gift. You have put joy in my heart greater than all the world's riches. I lie down trusting the darkness, for I know that even now you are here. Psychiatrist M. Scott Peck wrote a very famous book in 1978, The Road Less Traveled, and it is still largely purchased and read these days. His topic is timeless, speaking to people of all ages and through the generations. He begins with three simple words. Life is difficult. The rest of the book is how to live in light of this truth. Because it is true for everyone, no matter who you are or where you are from or what you did, life is difficult. It is true for all of us. And as Christians, the season of Lent is a time to take on these difficulties and to move through pain and struggle. Whether we call it the desert, the wilderness, or simply a Midwestern winter, the extreme conditions challenge our spirit, our soul, and our will. And the Lenten journey is an invitation to get face to face with these challenges, no matter how much it will break us. Because at the other end of the journey, there is new life to celebrate. Now, it's not uncommon for pastors to hear concerns about how discouraging or depressing we can be during Lent, and isn't there something we can say to lighten the topic, or can't we simply focus on the joy of Easter? It's as if the point of Lent is to wallow in our misery and our hard stories. Sometimes people do this, especially if they are a four on the Enneagram, and yes, that's me, before I matured into my foreness, as I hope I, I have, wallowing was my way of coping. And let me tell you, the best wallowing companion is a customized mixtape. <laughs> and yes, I'm dating myself here because I'm talking about an audio tape, not a CD and not a playlist on my iPod. But in those earlier years when I felt the slightest rejection from a love interest, I sought comfort from Brian Adams, or Journey, or Phil Collins, and the sappiest of playlists. But we are not here to wallow in our pain. We are here to try to comprehend it, to understand it, to move through it. Although pain can leave us feeling dumbfounded, and sometimes all we want to or can do is make a mixtape. But here's why it's so important. Here is why Christians take six weeks of every year to invite our pain and our struggle to come to the surface. It's how you choose to move through the pain and difficulties of life is more important and has more impact on your life and character than any other kind of decision you make. It's more important than where you went to school, what your job is, and even who you choose to marry your character, your identity, your very spirit and your soul, the deepest sense of who you are is being forged as you move through the pain and difficulty that life is. Now moving through requires asking that now what question. Perhaps you're saying, I'm struggling with pain in my family, now what? I'm struggling with disappointment with my work or at school. Now what? 
I'm struggling with rejection and loneliness in my relationships. Now what? I am struggling with the consequences of bad decisions. Now what? These are the kinds of questions we are encouraged to ask and to work through, especially during the season of Lent. Now that I have made the Lenten journey feel even more daunting, I want to share with you the story of Job so that we can find some inspiration and tap into our courage. Job falls into the category of wisdom literature along with Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Psalms and the Song of Solomons, all these beautiful pieces um, in the Bible that raise a set of questions that the history section or the prophetic works are a little different. The wisdom literature, we ask questions like, what lesson can we take from this book? What wisdom does it offer? What does it teach us about God or about ourselves or about ourselves in relation to God? Job, one of the longest books in the Bible, is a story of Job's great pain and how he moves through it and lives into an extravagant new life. Job won't let us wallow in our pain. Job won't let us lean on reward and punishment theology in those times when we want to complain and say, why is God doing this to me? What have I done to deserve this? Job won't let us blame ourselves or blame God. Job faces some of the most incredible struggles that any one person can have. The story opens with how good and righteous Job is and tells of all that Job has acquired, a family, a fortune, and a robust faith in God. God is so proud and confident in Job's righteous spirit, even boastful, that when God is questioned by Satan, which is best translated here as the accuser or the adversary, God lists Job as the model child, the one who can experience anything and remain faithful and true. And so the accuser tests Job, taking his children, his wealth, and his health, casting sores upon his body from head to toe. And in the midst of his deep struggle, Job grieves. He gets angry, he questions, he doubts, he gets depressed. He is literally down in the dumps. And even after his wife and three friends try to make Job feel better and to explain away these tragedies to a God of punishment and reward, Job stands firm in his resolve that God will have an explanation for what has happened to him when he gets a chance to question God. So for 37 long chapters, we hear the wild explications and feel the distress of Job. We witness the reactions and the debates of loved ones surrounding him. And then God's voice is finally heard. Out of the whirlwind, God proceeds to question Job for some 100 plus verses. This conversation was not quite what Job was expecting as he had prepared his case against God for a courtroom presentation. But the long, detailed presentation that God makes is what eventually speaks to Job, breaking open his perspective and drawing him into greater intimacy with God. It is what shapes a fresh perspective on the wondrous and fathomless creation that moves and lives and is the heart of God. In response to God's questions, Job says, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I had heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. I know you. You are with me. Even though life is difficult, you walk with me through it. It is through God's rant on the beauties and wonders of creation that we come to see our God operating according to reckless generosity, irrational love, 
an incessant delight in giving for no particular reason at all. Job's story is about widening the lens. It's about living without the answers we most want to hear and living in the awe of what is. The journey of Lent is about keeping company with pain, moving through, breaking apart, and trusting that we will find more life than death on the other side. Thankfully, we don't need Job's problems to meet God, but we can take Job's story and the generous, loving, and delighting God he eventually discovers and know that God can take it all and that God won't turn from us even when we delve into the deepest pain and express the strongest doubts and the most furious anger. During Lent, I invite us to trust that God has not and does not abandon us, to trust that God can hold, carry, and love all our pieces, no matter how broken, how cracked, how diseased and unworthy they seem and feel to us and to others. And to trust ourselves to raise the deep, lurking questions that we'd rather ignore. And know that this kind of trust, any trust for that matter, requires risk and vulnerability. Just a few weeks ago, when I turned 40, which felt like a huge milestone for me, the decade of my 30s brought on significant change and personal transformation, some that I worked really hard towards and some that seemed to appear out of nowhere. This milestone moment was an impetus to look deeply at my life and to come to terms with what I have pushed aside or ignored. I'll be the first to admit that I have been in survival mode, in the best sense of the word. Over the past four and a half years, I have gotten married, bought my first house, birthed three children, and continued working full time. Now what, I ask? All of these changes require a change in my worldview, a change in my vision for the future. This Lent, I want to break open that which has pushed aside and that what has, I want to push, I want to break open what I have pushed aside and what I believe hinders the personal and the family growth that is needed now and in my future. It is time to question, to doubt, and to be honest with myself and with others. I know that change is in the air and that change is difficult. And yet I can't help but remember the story that Ben Guest told at the end of his sermon a few weeks back. He was telling us about a text conversation he was having with his own mom, a conversation about his mother's sister who was dying of cancer. And Ben was texting with his mom to check in and her response to him was, I can do this. My faith has made me strong. I feel the same way. So I ask you, how will you move through this Lent season? How will you respond to your now what questions? What are your now what questions? As you walk the journey of Lent, may you wrestle with the difficulties at hand. May you express your truth to God, and may you feel fullness in your living, the despairing and the joyful. For we are all significant to God, and we are equally significant to the ones who receive blessings and the ones who struggle. Please be with me in prayer. In your presence, O oh God, we become aware of how little we know of ourselves, of our interests and passions, 
of our fears and dreads, of our own wonderments and gifts. In your truthfulness, let us know more of you and in knowing you ourselves as well. <laughs>